Hi, I'm Thomas Broadhead. I'm the editor of the Critical Performance Edition of the Ives Fourth Symphony. And in this video, I'm going to discuss and propose and articulate a theory that I have about Ives' music that, in part, what he is attempting to do is create what I would call aural parallax. Now, when I first looked at the Ives Fourth Symphony score when I was 15, the thing that struck me the most uh, were these subdivisions, and not just you know a triplet here or there, but these full measure subdivisions in which there were internal rhythms. And I had never seen anything quite like it before, and I really haven't seen anything like it since. Yes, there are complicated subdivisions that composers write and so on, but they're not doing anything quite like what Ives does. So let's take a look at a few examples of it, and I'll... I'll lead you towards my thinking about this. Here near the beginning of the comedy, uh, two or three solely violins uh, uh, play material that's to represent the pilgrims trudging alongside the tracks of the Celestial Railroad. Uh, and while the rest of the orchestra is in three, doing you know triplets on the beat, uh, these violins are subdividing each measure into four. But notice that they're doing internal rhythms within that subdivision into four. So he's not just giving you one, two, three, four. He's giving you this melody that's playing out with internal rhythms, right? Here's a place where the cornet is playing long, long ago for us. But it's doing it by subdividing the four, four measures into three and then doing internal triplets within them. So bum, bum, ba dum, 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 bum, right? Here in that five versus two passage we've discussed before, look at what's going on in the flutes. They're subdividing every five, eight bar into four and then articulating it further with internal rhythms. Well, what does it all outline? Well. It's the melody, There is a Happy Land. So he's not just giving you a subdivision into four. He's giving you a melody that's in a different tempo. And that's what's really going on here. He's throwing material into different tempos by using full measure subdivisions and articulating rhythms within the subdivisions. Now, elsewhere, we've discussed the large scale uh, polytemporal events that take place in the music, but we haven't touched on what happens in the prelude. Uh, right there on the very first page of the score, the distant choir of violins and harp participate in this very activity that I've been discussing where you know, they start off by playing with the main orchestra, and then in the fourth measure, they subdivide into five. And they're not giving you just five beats. They're articulating those beats into an internal rhythm that is outlining two different hymn tunes, Nettleton and Bethany, which they then continue to play throughout the movement. Um, so again, here it's happening. Now, what's interesting is on the next page, what takes place is they don't attempt to align what they are doing in any way with the main orchestra they take the value of the half note that's been established by the quintuplet subdivision of measure four, and they use that as the value of the half note moving forward. So effectively, they've gone into 5-2, and they just keep going with that 5-2. And the bar lines don't align here to show that there's no alignment that's to take place. And again, this is music that's moved into a, a new and different tempo than everything else around it. Now, moving ahead to the second movement, we get on the Celestial Railroad, and there we have a, a large-scale polytemporal event where the orchestra divides into two groups, and one accelerates on top of the other and then collapses, and, you know, and has to wait for the other one to catch up with it. And then a little bit later, uh, the train uh, slows down, and we have this interesting uh, device where Ives represents the train wheels slowing by having the instruments that are the representing the train wheels maintain a static tempo while the rest of the orchestra slows down. Again, though, what you've got is music that can be apprehended as uh, melodic that is not just an abstract rhythmic pattern, but something that that is easily understood within its own meter that's being played at a different rate of speed than other material. 
And this is very curious. He doesn't do it just in the fourth symphony. Here we're looking at a page from Ives' second orchestral set in the last movement called Hanover Square North. And in it, we have a chamber orchestra at the top of each page that's playing in three against a main orchestra that's playing in four. And what's going on in the main orchestra looks a little bit like Renaissance polyphony, but with these um, large full-scale subdivisions, right? Uh, what's going on musically, though? It's a, a treatment of in the suite by and by, and it's an attempt to reproduce an event that Ives witnessed uh, of when the news of the sinking of the Lusitania began to spread throughout New York. Uh, Ives was on a commuter platform at Hanover Square North, and as the news spread around the platform, everyone began to break into song and sing uh, this tune in the suite by and by. And here, at this point in the movement, you can imagine that it's different strains are being sung by people at different places on the platform, and they're not in sync, and they're all singing sort of in their own tempos. So here he's got, in the violins, the, the, the music moving along with subdivisions changing from measure to measure. So it's three, and then five, and then six, and then three, and then four. And the solo piano is two, and three, and five, and four, and three. And the violas are five, and four, and seven, and five, and seven. And nothing is matching anything else, right? But that's not the point. It's to represent an acceleration and deceleration of the line in this sort of rhapsodic way that the, 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 the commuters were probably singing this music in different corners of the platform. Um, and so again, here is this interest in representing music moving at different rates of speed unto itself and uh, you know, one instrument against another. Now, the second orchestral set finale and the comedy movement of the Fourth Symphony both involve trains, right? Well, did Ives have a special interest in trains? Perhaps. Um, he definitely took them all the time because during the warm months of the year, he would take a train from New York City where he had worked at the office to West Reading where they had their summer home uh, where Edith and, and Harmony would be waiting for him. So he was taking a train every day, six months of the year, when people talk about him composing music on the train. That's really unlikely that he did because the trains at the time were quite you know, shaky and you know, try you know, writing during a shaky train. No, it's hard to do. Try writing music especially. Yeah. So side note, I don't think he was really composing anything on a train. I think he might be thinking of ideas on a train. And one idea in particular is germane to this discussion. And that's this visual effect that you get when you're looking out a train window as things are whizzing by. Now, the things that are closest are going like this. And the things that are a little bit further back are going like this. And then further back than that, they're going like that. And then in the great distance, they're moving very slowly. In fact, if you're on a train out west with the mountains in the, in the, the distance, the mountains are moving like this, right? So this is something that I've saw all the time. And in the essays before a sonata, he writes at great length about whether or not it's possible to represent, you know, a stone wall with vines growing on it and that kind of thing. And he starts, you know, plumbing the depths of whether or not music can represent visual phenomenon. And he, he's really, you know, making a point about this as though it's something that's central to his, um, his work as a composer. And we know from the Social Railroad and the comedy movement, you know, definitely he, he was imagining these visuals, right? So he was sensitive to that. He was sensitive to, to visual effects. He's a musician. He's, he's sensitive to timing. So he's going to notice uh, things around him that are happening in, in, in time, right? Parallax is the apparent change in position of objects relative to a viewer based on the distance between the viewer and the objects. So the objects that are very far away from a viewer uh, have a very small apparent change in position as the viewer moves in relation to them. But objects that are very close to the viewer uh, have a very great uh, apparent change of position as the viewer uh, moves in relation to them.
parallax is usually discussed in physics and astronomy courses in reference to uh, the lack of stellar parallax on, on the Earth. And specifically, that's referencing the, the fact that there is no apparent change in the position of the stars at night. Uh, because it doesn't really matter where you stand on the Earth. Uh, the stars are so far away that there's not going to be any apparent shifting of their positions. So that's where parallax is normally discussed. But, you know, you're really experiencing it Anytime you're in a moving vehicle and you're looking out across a vista and you're seeing things that are moving at different rates of speed. And this is exactly what Ives was experiencing every time he was on a train and looking out at it and seeing, you know, things across the vista, you know, moving at these different rates. I think this is what he is representing with um, these lines that are being subdivided, you know, into whole measure subdivisions and, you know, material that's moving at different rates of speeds and these like large block-like patterns. Um, it's an aural equivalent of a visual phenomenon. It's what I would call aural parallax. And I don't know of any other composer who has attempted to um, represent it. And once you... Uh, see this in Ives' music, you start, in, in one piece, you start noticing it everywhere in his music. Uh, I think that he was probably very sensitive to things happening at different rates of speed around him. And that gets rep reproduced in small in a lot of his pieces. And then pieces like the comedy movement with the train moving and all that, and then the second orchestra set, it's, it's writ large. But this is something that um, I've never encountered anywhere in print that anyone has ever explored but i think it's it's yet something else that's been hiding in plain sight in his music that uh, that needs to be explored i discussed this with ludovic morlow before he did the fourth symphony with uh, seattle um back in january of, of 2015 and he brought it up before the audience and discussed it in brief uh so some people who were there might have uh Heard what he had to say and 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 thought about it. Maybe maybe something is being written somewhere by someone. But uh, as far as I know, this little video is the, the first attempt that I know of of anyone to try to discuss this topic. So there it is for for someone to pick up and to explore fully. <laughs>